I love Nintendo, namely The Legend of Zelda. If you haven't heard of it, then open your eyes, because you clearly have been asleep for 100 years, or 32 years at least. The Legend of Zelda series is, well, legendary. The stories, the world building, the quirky and unique character designs, the fun settings and the cool creatures that you meet in them, the action, the magic, the adventure, the music. God, the music is so good. Oh, and the unique experience each game brings to the table. Like some games are more lighthearted and cute, some are more dark and edgy. Seriously, there is something for everybody in this series. And it's wonderful. So why am I talking about a video game on this channel? This isn't the leaderboard. Subscribe. While I was live streaming on my Twitch the other day, not Zelda, but I will eventually, somebody in the chat brought up a fascinating question. Was The Legend of Zelda inspired by the Black Cauldron? Uh, I don't know. It's been over a decade since I've watched it, but a potential conspiracy where I can talk about both Nintendo and Disney? You're damn right I'm gonna cover it. I'm Arielle with Channel Frederator, and it's time to press start. So, all right, when talking about medieval post-Tolkien fantasies like these two, by post-Tolkien, I mean any fantasy that's come out in the decades after the genre-defining Lord of the Rings was written, you expect to see all of the cliches. You've got your castles with kings and queens and other royalty. They have their knights and their heroes of all kinds wielding their swords and shields. They're surrounded by fantastical creatures like fairies, dwarves, and elves. And they're all fighting powerful sorcerers and monsters and witches and goblins, and there's magic involved, and you know a dragon's going to show up eventually, blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm talking about. All of these elements are fine and good. Great even, I love dragons, but it's what you do with these elements that makes your fantasy unique. And our claim today is that Nintendo's The Legend of Zelda drew inspiration from Disney's The Black Cauldron. When you think about what I just said about cliches, you could honestly make that claim about any two European style fantasy stories, couldn't you? Before I get into the argument, maybe I should familiarize you with both of our subjects, at least a little. The very first Legend of Zelda game came out on the original Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES in February of 1986. From your top-down perspective, you played as a little pixelated elf boy named Link who was very suddenly dropped into an adventure. Games were very straightforward back then. As Link, the first thing you do is enter a cave and the random old man says the famous phrase, it's dangerous to go alone, take this, hands you a magical sword and then you're off to save Princess Zelda from the evil King Ganon. There's a large map you get to explore, there are secrets to be discovered, monsters to fight, and your arsenal of different weapons you can choose to fight with. Frankly, you can tackle the different dungeons in any order you want if you're smart about it. And for a game of that time period, all this was pretty impressive. Now over time, it's grown so much bigger and grander. Now it's got this whole mythos and a history and a timeline. It has recurring characters that we love and beautifully iconic music that we're familiar with. As a person who got into the Zelda series by playing the later games, it's amazing to look back and see its foundation. You know, what Nintendo built upon. Somehow in 16 bits, the land of Hyrule still feels like home. And it's really cool. Now the Black Cauldron. It sucks. Yeah. Fine, I'll be fair. So the movie, which was released in 1985, is based off of the first two novels of the series of books titled The Chronicles of Prydain. We follow this boy, Turan, who is the keeper of an oracle who happens to be a pig. He wishes he were a knight instead of a simple pig keeper. When Hemwyn the pig foresees that the movie's bad guy, the Horned King, is going to come after her so she can show him where the Black Cauldron is, it's up to Turan to bring Hemwyn to safety before the Horned King gets her. All I've got to say is, Karen, you had one job! That's not a spoiler. He f***s up at the 15 minute mark. The Black Cauldron itself is a prison for an evil king, and for some reason that means that if you drop a dead guy into it, you can raise an army of skeletons and use them to take over the world. So Turan goes on a coming of age quest to stop the Horned King's evil plot with his friends Princess Alonwi, this bard guy with a name I can't pronounce, and this abomination. Alright, honestly, just get rid of Gurgi, and this whole movie will be so much easier to sit through. But it's not easy. It has Gurgi in it. The movie was a massive box office failure, and Jeffrey Katzenberg himself, yeah, that guy. Jacob, can you give me a little lightning strike at the mention of his name? Thanks. Jeffrey Katzenberg, who had just started his job as the head of Disney Animation at the time, has been quoted saying, the story was a once in a lifetime opportunity and it was heartbreaking to see such wonderful material wasted. Honestly, after everything I've read, this is one of his nicer quotes. He hated this flick. But the source material is apparently way better, which is probably why it's on Disney's upcoming live action movie list. They want to give it another shot. That being said, I'm not going to go into details about the Chronicles of Prydain books, because to be clear, our theory is that The Legend of Zelda pulled from the existing movie alone. Plus, being honest, I haven't read them. But hey, if anyone in the comments has read the books and has anything to add by the end of this video, by all means, let us know. I'm curious. So 
here we are. We have two pieces of fantasy media and they're both kind of doing their own thing. Where does the alleged overlap come from? Is it because there's a boy protagonist in both the game and the movie who wears green and wields a sword? Is it because there's also a blonde princess in pink and purple and they're all trying to stop an evil king from taking over? Eh. While some of that is a coincidence, that's just still your basic European style fantasy I was talking about earlier. At its core, you know, the hero princess evil king formula, that also describes Mario. When I sat down to watch The Black Cauldron for the first time as an adult, I was concerned that this was all I would have to back this theory up. But it surprised me. Not that it was better than I remembered. Oh God, no. I'm sorry, can you guys also leave in the comments why there's a cult following for this? It's aesthetics, right? It's gotta be aesthetics. No, no, no. It was the specific evidence I found to back up the theory. I'll walk you through my train of thought. My notes started out very unimpressed. I wrote down right at the start that they are both based on Welsh mythology, which again, European fantasy, castles and dragons, it's a thing. The opening narration of Cauldron tells us the story of how the Black Cauldron was used to seal away their demon king. And yeah, Ganondorf is also a demon king who's been sealed away his fair share of times. Um, okay, but how many times have we heard that one? Taran wears a green tunic, we got that. He wants to wield a sword. He wants to be a hero. He wants adventure in the great wide somewhere. They mention he has courage, but that's grasping at straws. I'm a reporter. I need something big. Lots and lots of complaints about Gurgi and Oh, I questioned why they would name a pig hen when they live on a farm. That's gotta be confusing. Ah, here we go. So Princess Alanwi makes her way into the film. She's a blonde like Zelda and she has a similar color scheme on her dress. I already knew her design going in, so that was no surprise. But what grabbed my attention was her floating glowy orb companion. Dude, how random is that? See, if you're at least familiar with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and or its direct sequel Majora's Mask, you would know that Link runs around with a fairy friend who floats around his head the entire game. It's just a circle of light, an orb with wings. Alonwi's orb is just a little bobble of magic and the movie eventually does show us actual fairies, but the orb was still sentient and the way that it moved and acted reminded me so much of Link's fairy pals that I just couldn't ignore it. At that point, I figured that must be it. That must be why people compare the movie to the games. Nope. That's not all. Right after we meet Alonwi, a few minutes later, Taran finally finds a sword. I'm thinking, whatever, he got himself a sword. Um, no, actually it's not just a sword. It's a magic sword. I mean, we've seen magic swords before, but that's not often the case. Like swords are already weapons. So giving them magic is kind of overkill, isn't it? In the original Legend of Zelda game, the sword would shoot out beams across the screen at the enemies. So it was magical too. Oh, and the master sword that Link famously wields, it holds the power to defeat evil. It's the only sword that can defeat Ganon. The Black Cauldron had my attention, but I didn't think it would get any better than the floating orb. And then it got better than the floating orb. I am not joking. There is a pot smashing scene. There is a scene where Terran smashes a bunch of pots. Not even in anger, his magic sword just starts going ham on them until they're all shattered around his feet. I can't be the only one who thinks that's funny. If you're not familiar with Zelda, it might not be as funny to you. I'm gonna have to explain the joke. Okay, so in the Legend of Zelda games, to stock up on free supplies or to straight up rob people of their money, you can pick up and throw or smash any pots that you find. If you've been on the internet for a while, you've had to have seen at least one meme of Link's urges to go into people's homes and break their pots. Terran smashes pots, theory confirmed. Oh wait, no, not yet. I have one more thing for you. So the rest of the movie rolls on by. I hated it. It ends abruptly. And then I just sat there for a little while on my phone, just, letting the credits roll and letting the music play. Eventually I got up, I turned off my TV and I walked away. And as I was making tea in my kitchen, I found myself humming Saria's song from Zelda, the song that plays in the infamous Lost Woods. It's a very popular Zelda song, listen. No, I don't want to talk to Saria. See, this was a moment of subconsciousness because in my mind, I was just humming the song that was playing during the Black Cauldron's credits because it was stuck in my head. And I was like, no, you're straight up humming Saria's song. That's not what they were playing on the TV. Wait, what? The Black Cauldron credits music uses the same three key notes as Saria's song. Listen to the two back to back and it sounds like one is trying to be an off-brand, trying not to get a copyright strike version of the other. Are you kidding me with that? Now, I know what some of you are already thinking. Let's get right into this. 
What I realized when introduced to this theory is that when people ask this question, they are referring to the original 1986 NES Zelda game that I was talking about before. This is probably because both Zelda and the Black Cauldron came out around the same time, but too close to the same time. Usually the answer to this question is a solid no. Black Cauldron is a 1985 film, remember? Development on the original Legend of Zelda started in 1984. Unless Zelda's creator Shigeru Miyamoto had an in with Disney and knew what they were working on, there's no way Nintendo would have seen the movie in time to make any changes. In fact, the Black Cauldron may have been released in America in 85, but it reached Japan in 86 when Zelda was already on the shelves. So. The magic sword, the colors of their outfits, the demon king, those are all just coincidence. However, the floaty glowing orb fairies didn't appear in The Legend of Zelda until Ocarina of Time in 1998, and Breaking Pots started with The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past in 1992. The Black Cauldron had been out for a while then, so who says they didn't look back at this forgotten Disney movie and go, hey, this movie tanked. Um, care if we plucked out a few ideas, right? I am not here saying that anything was a ripoff. No, it's all inspiration for sure. Or again, just pure coincidence because there is no surefire proof that this is the case. It's a two out of five. Look, all I'm saying here is that Fairy, specifically Navi the Fairy, Saria Song, and Pop Breaking are not just random minor little details I plucked out to make this conspiracy work. These are all very iconic and reoccurring parts of these games that all fans are familiar with. And it's crazy interesting to discover that this could possibly possibly be a piece of heritage for one of our favorite video games. Something new to put up onto the Zelda inspiration shelf right next to Miyamoto's childhood backyard exploration and Peter Pan. Hey, even if you don't buy it, it's always fun to talk Zelda and I still got to wear the ears. In case you forgot, my name is Ariel, also known as R2 Ninja Turtle on the rest of the internet. And remember, Red Arita loves you.